Well, hey, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are back in our auditorium. Uh, we're kicking off a brand new series today. And if it looks a little different, again, we're trying to change things back up, trying to get a little bit more back to normal. Again, the staff has kindly uh, decided to join me in here today in their max because, quite frankly, I was just sick of preaching to a... Uh, camera and so you guys are back in here and I really really appreciate you being here. I thank you for joining us today and we're kicking off a series that I'm very excited about and we're calling the series 2020 part two and the reason we're starting this series today is because I'm not sure if you've looked at a calendar but 2020 feels like it has taken about eight and a half years and we are only halfway through the year. If anything we're at halftime. And I don't know about you, but, but, but I'm tired of 2020. Uh, there's a lot of things that have happened in 2020 I don't like. There's probably a lot of things that have happened in 2020 you don't like. There's things we weren't prepared for. There's things we still don't feel like we're equipped to handle. And so when we look at it, we say, man, we're only halfway through this year. How are we going to move forward? And that is the question uh, that I want us all to begin answering today. Uh, and to really just spend the next few weeks answering, because I am convinced that God actually does have a path forward for us. And it's a path forward that's going to lead to good things. It's a path forward that's going to lead to joy. It's a path forward, as we've been talking about all year, that is going to lead to better. So if, if you look forward into 2020 and, and you feel dread, you feel dread about more quarantining, you feel dread about uh, what are we going to do about school, we get it, we are with you. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. And I actually want to dive right in today because I want to begin with an encouragement. And it's an encouragement that God actually gave me when I was in a meeting about when we were going to gather again for live services. Uh, we were in a meeting in mid-June in mid talking about what we were going to do. And we were sort of dreading the decision we had to make. And it was into that moment that God spoke to me and brought a verse to mind. And it's a verse I want to share with you, and we're going to build on it for this entire series. And this is the verse that God brought to mind. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. I'll be real honest with you. When God brought this verse to mind, I did not want to hear it because I was tired of doing what's good. As I said, we were in a meeting in mid-June trying to figure out if we could um, regather live on the weekend. Uh, we had uh, prayed as a lead team. We had sought uh, expertise from other people, and we came together in mid-June because we decided that's when we were going to make our decision about July. And we all got together, and within about three minutes of that meeting, we knew what we were supposed to do. About three minutes in, we knew that we had to continue online only for July. We knew it based on the metrics we had created. We knew it based on the situation here in Myrtle Beach. We knew it based on what our authorities were asking us to do. Within three minutes, we knew what was right. We knew what was good. And we spent another hour and a half in that meeting talking ourselves into doing it. And it was in that moment that God spoke and he said, hey, hey, let's not get tired of doing what is good. Because Wellspring, I'll be honest, I'm tired of doing what is good. I'm tired of not gathering with you. I'm tired of the quarantining. I'm tired of masks. I'm tired of not being able to connect with people. I am tired of it, but I know that it's good. And I'm pretty sure you have experienced the very same thing. You know, I think we all have in this room, we've all had moments where we knew what the good thing was to do, but we just get tired of it. Has that ever happened to you? You know a step God wants you to take and you take it, but the result doesn't come quite as quickly as you thought it would. The addiction isn't broken yet. The marriage isn't healed yet. The children's behavior hasn't improved yet. And we get tired. We get tired of doing what is good. See, there's always a space between a step of obedience God gives us and the benefit of that obedience. Sometimes that space is a second, sometimes it's a minute, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's years, sometimes it's decades. And as Christ followers, as people who, who claim to love Jesus, we have to understand that sometimes there is going to be that space. And particularly in this season, I believe that space just continues to expand because we don't know when it's going to end. And it is in to that moment our Heavenly Father speaks to us and reminds us, let's not get tired of doing 
is good. Let's not get tired of doing what we know is right. Let's not get tired of doing what we know is loving. Let's not get tired of doing what we know is best. And so we were in that meeting. And after about an hour and a half of discussion, we decided we weren't going to be tired of doing what is good. And that was when we began to develop the plans to stay on not only in July, it's when we announced it to you. And then when the meeting was over, I, I still wasn't settled. I still was, was confused. I mean, yeah, let's not get tired of doing what is good. It's not very encouraging. It doesn't really spur me forward. It's just this command. And I'm like, all right, God, I mean, I'll do what you say. But, but it wasn't really encouraging me. And so when the meeting was over, I actually opened my Bible. Because the only part God had brought to mind was, let's not get tired of doing what is good. And so I turned in my Bible to Galatians 6, which is where it is, and I read the entire verse. And, and what I had forgotten is that God had attached a promise to that instruction. And here's the promise. He says, at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. See what, see what God's saying to us is, hey, I know there's going to be a space. I know it's going to be hard. And I know sometimes you're not going to want to keep going. I know sometimes you're going to get tired. So I want to go ahead and tell you in advance, hey, 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 trust me, because at just the right time, my time, not your time, that's how God works, but at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing. And so as I listened to, to God and I prayed there and I read that verse and I was like, okay, God, this, okay, this verse is actually helpful and what, what, what I realized is, all right, God, maybe I need to go back and read the rest of this chapter because if you're giving me this promise, it's possible you've given me some instructions to walk out this promise. And so I read the entire chapter of Galatians uh, uh, 6, and what I discovered is Paul does exactly that. Paul gives us a process. Paul gives us steps. He doesn't just say, hey, keep doing good. He tells us why, and he tells us how. So, Wellspring, what I want to do today is I want us to walk through that passage because I believe the very same message God gave me, he wants to give you, and he wants to give all of us. And he wants to not just simply encourage us to keep doing good. He wants to tell us how. And he wants to assure us that even in this season, he's with us. And he wants to promise us that as we move forward into 2020, as we look at 2020 part two, that we can move forward in confidence that he's with us, that he's for us, that he's in control, and that he still wants to give us the best life possible. So if today you find yourself tired of doing what is good, you are not alone. And our gracious Heavenly Father knows it. And today He is going to give us a path forward to help us walk where He wants us to walk. So at home, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians 6, because that's where we're going to be. And so when you read the chapter of Galatians 6, the very first verse, what Paul does, is Paul addresses sin. Because when we talk about doing good and we talk about not getting tired of doing good, the number one thing that's going to make us tired from doing good is to walk in sin. Because I don't know about you, but in my life, anytime I walk towards sin, I find that I'm walking away from God. And the more I walk away from God, the more tired I get. And so he addresses it. He says, hey, hey if there's sin in your life, uh, get rid of it. If there are friends and family in your life and you can see it in their life, lovingly help them, bring them back, try, try to get rid of those things. And so that's just easy. You know, right now in this season, if, if we've given in to some bad habits, if we've given in to some, some things, that, that, that this is a good opportunity for 2020 part two, next steps, new season, new year. We can say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm going to throw those things off. You need to have some conversations, throw those things off. And then in verse two, he begins to give us, a, hey, once you've done that, here's how you can lean into each other. Here's how you can love each other and serve each other and walk together into the future that he promises for us. And he says something amazing. Here's what he says in verse 2. He says, share each other's burdens. Now, the word burden there, uh, the Greek word he uses, uh, that Paul uses there is the Greek word baros, and it literally means a heavy stone or heavy object that someone has to carry for a long distance. And it's such a perfect picture, I think, of, of the weights we all feel right now. We all feel burdens, and we all feel these weights that we feel like we have to carry, and we don't know when those are going to end. Uh, for some of those, it is, it is COVID. It is the health risk and the health scare. It is a 
burden that is weighing us down. For others, it's, it's a financial burden. For others, it's a, it's a marital burden. It's just anything that causes stress in our life, anything that makes our life feel heavy. What Paul is saying is he said, hey, 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 if you want to move forward, you have to share those burdens. You have to share them with each other. What he's saying is, I see you. I see you struggling. I understand what's happening. And your path forward is going to involve sharing with other people. You do not have to carry those burdens alone. You do not have to shoulder that weight. What he's saying is, in my kingdom, when you're walking with me, people will come alongside you to help. And you can come alongside to help other people. I want you to share those burdens. And then Paul says something that I find amazing because he's simply talking about helping other people, sharing each other's burdens. And then he says this, he says, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. So what he's saying is, he's saying when you choose to help each other, when you choose to share each other's burdens, you are serving Jesus. And he uses this phrase, the law of Christ. This is a phrase Paul uses only one other time in all his letters. And as best we can understand, when he says the law of Christ, what he means is the summary of everything Jesus taught. And so what he's saying is, when you choose to share each other's burdens, when you choose to help each other, you are doing exactly what Jesus wants you to do. Now, that word share is kind of fascinating, because I don't know about you, but I have a very, very uh, fickle relationship with the word share. Uh, if you have something and I want it, I am very pro-sharing. I want you to share. If I have something and you want it, I have to think about the sharing a little bit. I'm not quite as pro-sharing as I was before. And so what Paul's talking about is sharing burdens, sharing weights, sharing struggles, sharing things that weigh us down. And we hear that and we think, I would love to share mine with someone else. I would love to give those away. That sounds amazing. But if you're asking me to carry someone else's burden, you're asking me to pick up more weight? I don't think so. I mean, think about it right now. We are all operating at 100% capacity. We all feel exhausted mentally, emotionally, physically. And Paul is saying that our path forward, in fact, the way we serve Jesus is to carry each other's burdens, to share each other's burdens, to step in and help. I don't know about you, but I hear that and I think, I'm not sure how that's going to help. I'm not sure how that's going to help me do things and make me feel better and give me more energy moving forward. And Paul knew you'd say that. And Paul knew I would say that. And number one, that's why Paul ties it to Jesus. That's why Paul says, hey, when you do this, you're serving Jesus. Because again, as Christ followers, we're supposed to want to serve Jesus and we're supposed to want to obey. But then Paul moves on and he gives us another verse. And this verse is fascinating. And when you hear this verse, it's going to sound very accusatory. It's going to sound very harsh. In fact, let me go ahead and read it to you because Paul says, share each other's burdens in this way. You're going, to, you're going to fulfill the law of Christ. And he hears people saying, I don't know if I can help anybody else. I don't know if I can share each other's burdens. I don't know if I can do anything else. And so, this is what Paul says. Paul says, well, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. I love Paul. He was so just gentle and sweet. But what he's saying is he's saying, look, I understand that you're going to have this pushback. I understand when we think about being tired that the last thing we want to do is help someone else. And what we do, we do, we, do, we begin to convince ourselves I'm too important. I've got too many things to carry. I've got too much to do. There's no way I can pick up someone else's burden. And again, if, if you feel that way, I understand. I feel that way. And it's why this verse is so important. Because what Paul's actually trying to do is he's trying to change the way we think. Because if he can change the way we think, he can change the way we act. And when we change the way we act, we change the way we feel. See, we feel tired. And Paul knows the beginning of this is to change the way we think, to begin to want to share each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. And the reason he phrases this way, if you think you're too, help, too, too important to help someone, See, it all comes down to one thing. It all comes down to how we define this word. It all comes down to how we define someone. Because when we use this kind of um, anonymous language, we can all say, yeah, I'm too, I'm too important to help that person. I'm too important to help this person. So let's make it specific. 
How many of you would say, I'm too important to help grandma? No one, right? I'm too important to help mom. I'm too important to help Uncle Carl. I'm too important to help my children. See, we all have a someone that we would put there, and we know we are not too important to help. It doesn't matter how tired we are. It doesn't matter how much we've done. We drop everything. When mom calls, when dad calls, when grandpa calls, when Aunt Sally calls, we drop everything and we go do it. We go pick up their burdens. Do you know why? Because that someone is special to us. Because that's a someone we love. That's a someone that matters to us. And when they are struggling, when they have burdens, we willfully pick up their burden. We willfully say, let me lighten their load. In fact, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever had someone in your life, a loved one, and you hear a story, and they tell you about a struggle they've gone through, and you look at them and you say, Dad, why didn't you call me? Mom, why didn't you call? Why didn't, why didn't you reach out? Why didn't you ask me for help? And what do they say? What do they always say? Oh, I didn't want to be a burden. We even get offended because those people didn't reach out and ask for our help. We get our feelings hurt. Why didn't you reach out to me? Why didn't that someone ask me to help them carry their So back to the verse again. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. Because you're exactly right. If you think you're too important to help grandma, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. If you think you're too important to help your kids, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. It all comes down to how we define someone. And this is why Paul refers to the law of Christ. Because when Jesus was on earth, Everything he taught was an encouragement for Christ followers to expand the definition of someone and to expand what you would do for that someone and apply it to everyone. And if you don't think that's what Jesus meant, let me take you to Matthew 5 real quick because here's what he says in Matthew 5. I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, Jesus doesn't just mean love your friends and love your enemies. Jesus is expanding the definition of who we should love. And so the reason he picks enemies is because he knows we're going to love our friends. And he knows we're going to love our family. And he knows we might even be nice to strangers. He knows the hardest person it's ever going to be for us to love is someone who is an enemy. Someone who is actively working against us. Someone who is actively trying to hurt us. And so what Jesus does is he says, I want to throw this definition all the way to the other side. I want you to understand that when you think about the someone you should help, it includes everyone, even your enemies. And we say, well, Jesus, why does that matter so much? And he explains a few verses later. He says, hey, it's simple. If you love only those who love you, well, then what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. And if you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Because even pagans do that. He's like, hey, if you only help certain someones, if you only help the someones that you love, if you only help the someones that matter, it doesn't really count because everyone does that. I want you to expand the definition of someone to include everyone. So let's go back to the verse, and let's read it in that sense. When you go back to, if you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself, you are not that important. What Jesus would say is that someone equals everyone. So the calling of a Christ follower is to choose, to serve, to love, to lean in, and to help Everyone. And you're in the room and you're, you're at home and you're wondering, okay, feels like you just put more on my plate. You've just given me more to do. How does this help? And the answer is that what we're talking about is the law of Christ. What we're talking about is the totality of Jesus' teaching. You know, the man that we believe died and came back to life to rescue us. The man that we believe came to give us a rich and satisfying life. The man that we believe is the hope of all things. Can you imagine a better path forward, a better position than to be right in the center of his will? 
And to be right smack dab where he wants us to be, to say, all right, Jesus, I want to move forward in 2020 in the center of you. I want to walk where you walk. I want to step where you step. I want to be in lockstep with you. I want to receive my strength from you. I want to receive my encouragement from you. I want to be exactly where you want me to be. Because when I'm there, I know your Holy Spirit can fill me with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Jesus, if you're there, I want to be there too. Because I know that is the path forward. And Jesus would say exactly. And to make that shift as we move forward in the second half of 2020, it's going to require one choice. A choice to choose to share each other's burdens. A choice to choose to obey the law of Christ and love everyone. And the way we do that is so simple, yet so difficult. Because what the law of Christ really teaches is this. Let's treat everyone like they are someone we love. The way you would drop everything for grandma, the way you would bend over backwards for your children, what Jesus is saying is the calling of a Christ follower is to apply that love to the world. We have a very specific example before us right now with COVID, with social distancing, with masks. It is incredible to me how masks have become this divisive issue. So let's apply the law of Christ to masks. Because here's what I know for everyone in this room and everyone watching online. If we are able, and some people aren't because of health reasons, I totally understand that, but if we are able to wear a mask, we all have someone in our life that we wear a mask for. We have friends, we have family. Maybe they have health issues, maybe they're at risk. And if they said, I want to see you, but you have to wear a mask, we would wear a mask. We would wear a mask for grandma. We would wear a mask for our aunt. We'd, we'd, We'd wear a mask for our pregnant daughter if she asked us to. We all know this. We know we would wear a mask for those people because we love those people. And we know wearing a mask will lighten the burden they have, will lighten the anxiety they have about their health, will lighten the fear they have in that moment. We would wear a mask for someone because we love them. But then we go to a store, and the store asks us to wear a mask. Or then the city or the county passes an ordinance to ask us all to wear masks. And we're like, oh no, I'm not going to wear a mask. That's infringing on my rights. How dare you ask me to do that? And Paul and Jesus would say, no, 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 no. The law of Christ says, if you would wear a mask for someone, then as a Christian, we wear a mask for everyone. Because our calling is to treat everyone like someone we love. And the reason is this, because everyone is someone God loves. Wellspring, do you understand that you have never locked eyes with anyone that God loves any less than he loves you? Do you understand that when God sees us, he sees people he loves. And those of us that call ourselves Christ followers, as we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks, have been given the privilege of partnering with our Heavenly Father to bring back those that don't have a relationship with Him yet. And the way we do that is by following the law of Christ. The way we do that is by choosing to treat everyone like we would treat someone we love. And if you're like me, your mind starts going crazy at this moment, and we start thinking about what that would look like in reality, and we start thinking about all the ways that might make our life harder, we start thinking about all the ways other people won't do that, and we start comparing, and we start looking, and you know what? Paul knew that's exactly what you were going to do, because here's what he says next. He says, hey, be, he says, pay careful attention to your own work. Pay careful attention to your own actions. Pay careful attention to your own love. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible 
for our own conduct. You know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, walking in the law of Christ means you measure your actions, you measure your behaviors, you measure your love, you measure how many burdens you can carry, and you don't keep score about what anyone else does. You don't spend time wondering, well, why aren't they loving me this way? Why aren't they helping me? Why aren't they stepping up? You know, I did this for them and they didn't do that for me. You know the reason some of us are exhausted right now is because we're spending too much time monitoring other people's behavior. You know who you can control? You. You know who you can't control? Anybody else. And you know what's exhausting? Spending energy on things you can't. Which is why Paul says, hey, this is, this is our calling. This is our path forward. Let's choose to treat everyone like someone we love. Let's bear each other's burdens. Let's carry it. But hey, let's stop keeping score. Let's stop measuring what other people are doing. Jesus says, hey, you don't have to keep score. I have your back. I'm with you. In fact, that's what he says a few verses later. He says, hey, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. What that means is you cannot manipulate God. You cannot do things that God says not to do and, for, and good things happen in the end. It may look that like, like it's happening in the middle, but God's way is best. You will always harvest what you plant. This is a confirmation for us. Do good. Trust God. Keep leaning in. Keep walking and don't concern yourselves with the other people that aren't. Pray for them. Love them, look for opportunities to connect with them, but don't let them take the energy from you as we try to move forward in this new season. Because if we call ourselves a Christ follower, if we call ourselves a Christian, that means we believe a man literally died and came back to life. We believe he is the source of our hope and the source of our life and the source of our eternal security. If we believe that, we can trust Him in this moment. That we're going to keep forward. We're going to be loving. We're going to do good. We're not going to concern ourselves with the people that aren't. We're going to love them. We're going to pray for them. But we're not going to lose sleep trying to change other people's behaviors. We're not going to lose sleep monitoring how many people are helping us in this moment. We are going to pour out and trust our Heavenly Father to fill us Oh. And so when we take all this together, share each other's burdens, fulfill the law of Christ, treat everyone like there's someone that you love and know that God's way is best. It's when we prep all that together that Paul's encouragement makes so much sense when he says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Because at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give and then he adds one more thing. He says, because all this is true, here's what we should do. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Everyone. Do you know why? Because it is what Jesus asked us to do. It is the summation of everything he taught. Paul called it the law of Christ. And what does the law of Christ say? It says, let's treat everyone like there's someone we love. Wellspring, what would life look like this week? We accept that challenge. If we chose to live every day, if we chose to see every moment, every encounter, every opportunity to treat everyone like they are someone we love. If we choose to embrace the idea that they are because everyone is someone God loves. Let's go back to the masks. Would we have debates about masks if we chose to put into practice the law of Christ? You know the answer to that. And I do too. We wear a mask. Because it's the loving thing to do. Because it eases the burdens of the people who are at risk. It eases the burdens 
the people who are afraid. It eases the burdens of people who get anxiety every time they step out their door. A simple act eases burdens. And when we walk in that obedience, when we walk in that burden, you know what happens? Jesus begins to ease our burden. We did a series a couple months ago where Jesus says, come to me when you are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you what? Rest. But the beginning of that sentence is, come to me. Walk with me. Walk in the law of Christ. So what would it look like if we chose this week to treat everyone like someone we love? I think we'd wear a mask. And you know what? As your church, we want to help. Which is why this Thursday, we're doing another drive through And we're going to hand out masks. We're having masks printed up. They say love and be on them. Because we think the most loving thing we can do right now is wear a mask. So if you have one, wear it. If you don't, make plans to be here on Thursday. And we're actually going to look for ways to ease each other's burdens even then. As you come to pick up your mask, you can drop off supplies, food for backpack buddies. Because we want to continue to ease the burdens of the people here in Myrtle Beach. As we've been talking about in our offering moments, we are looking for ways to ease financial burdens of the people in our church through the through this offering we're taking right now where you can step up and say, hey, I need help. If you are experiencing a financial burden right now, reach out because we want to help. Step up and say, I need help. And if you are not experiencing a financial burden, if God has blessed you in this season, this is your opportunity to step forward and say, I can help. I can give more. I can give above and beyond what I was giving to ease the burdens of other people here in Myrtle Beach. And starting in a few weeks, we've got something I'm really excited about. You'll hear about it more next week. We're calling it Drop-In Tuesdays uh, because we're looking for very creative ways to be able to open our facility on Tuesdays uh, for people who are just carrying heavy burdens to give them a place to come and, and drop them and surround them with people who can help carry them. We are with you in this season, Wellspring, and we know that our God wants to use us in this moment to move forward in an amazing way. In fact, next week, I'm going to talk about how I believe this is a once-in-a-lifetime moment for our church to truly be a shining city on a hill, to be a beacon of hope in Myrtle Beach. And it's all going to come down to one choice that I'm going to make and we're going to make, and I'm challenging you to make today. When you look forward to the rest of 2020, move forward with Jesus. And move forward deciding that me and you and all of us are going to take Paul up on his offer. We're going to lean in to what our Savior says. We're going to choose starting today to treat everyone like there's someone that we love. That we're going to serve that we're going to do what is kind, that we're going to do what is best. Because we know that our Heavenly Father loves Myrtle Beach, and as His representatives, we must as well. And we can rest in the knowledge that when we walk towards Jesus, He will provide the rest. Here's a really cool thing about a community of faith. Do you know when everyone decides to treat someone well, when everyone decides that they're going to love every someone in their life, when we all decide to treat someone well, and we all, when we all decide that, that, that everyone is going to be someone we love, you know what happens? Everyone has someone to love them back. Everyone has someone to carry their burdens with. That's who we are. That's who our church wants to be. So let's step 2020 together. Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. Uh, God, we're so thankful for your clarity. We're so thankful uh, that, that you teach us through Paul how we can move forward in this season. Father, I pray for all of us that we will not grow tired of doing what is good. Uh, God, I pray I give you that, that you give us the, 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 the power and the wisdom and the compassion and the love to treat everyone like there's someone we love. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your truth, and I pray that you, you use our church in this moment to draw people to you as we choose to treat everyone like there's someone we love.
In your son's amazing holy name we pray. Amen.